Hello and welcome to History 342. This is it, the last video of the term. So let me talk a little bit about kind of what happens in Japanese politics in particular uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, first of all, you have the very brief fall of the Liberal Democratic Party. They fall out of power in 1993. They return just over a year later. What happens to them? Well, um, uh, if we were all in the room together, I'd ask for guesses. If one political party has been in power at this point for um, almost 40 years with no credible opposition to them and no interruption, um, what kind of problems do you think might emerge in that party's running of the country? Uh, I'll give you a hint. It begins with the letter C and ends with eruption. Corruption, yes, they have massive corruption problems, um, such as the Lockheed scandal in 1972, the, what, the recruit incident of 1989, where, you know, the Japanese public had been willing to accept, as many publics are, a certain amount of, you know, grey area, um, good old boy network kind of stuff. Nobody was shocked by this. Everyone knew that if you wanted your son to work at, have a good job at Toyota, he should go to such and such a certain university. Um, Lockheed was a problem because basically, uh, you know, you had Japanese politicians uh, giving, you know, giving contracts to Lockheed for personal profit. Recruit was a company that paired job seekers with jobs. And again, it turns out they were, it was kickbacks to major government figures, basically in particular, such as Tanaka Kakue and Tanaka, who had been a really important figure. And the LDP was particularly exposed by the recruit incident. And so finally they fall in 1993 after, as I said, almost 40 years of skillful control of the Japanese political system. The LDP as a result becomes more factional. Tanaka passes away um, in 1993. And without him there to kind of hold everyone together, all these different groups, the LDP, start to fight each other. Now this actually wasn't necessarily you know, a new thing um, in LDP history. The reality is that when there's one big party that's effectively running the government, the truth is there are lots of different kind of constituencies within that broader group. Um, the same is true here in the United States where sure you have Democrats and Republicans, but lots of different flavors of Republican, lots of different flavors of Democrat. There's lots of different flavors of LDP. Even if a certain kind of a conservative Japanese figure tends to rise to the top of that particular kind of consolidation of ideas, you have all these different kinds of um, interests. And so with Tanaka passing away, um, the party kind of struggles. It does, however, regain power in 94 after a brief coalition government, and it loses power again much later on in the 21st century, but again recovers it relatively soon after that. This is all part of something new in Japanese society, at least something that hasn't been around since the end of the Second World War, which is uncertainty. Hirohito dies in 1989, and you know, he kind of dies a pretty controversial figure um, in Japan, To the, although they use the Western calendar, um, they still use these kind of imperial eras. And so the death of Hirohito was the end of the Showa era, um, which, you know, felt like a, it always feels like a big monumental moment. This is a major thing in Japanese society. His death, of course, his health had been covered very extensively in Japanese newspapers and in Japanese media and his passing away was a major, major moment in Japanese um, history. You also have in the early 1990s, the collapse of the bubble economy, um, which effectively, it, it's called a bubble economy in retrospect in large part because of the reliance on house prices um, and the importance of the stock market. The stock market turns out to be weaker than people realized and property prices become basically extremely expensive for your average Japanese person. And so the prices begin to stagnate and you don't have a vibrant housing market. You don't have property changing hands between individuals as much as you would like. You have lots and lots of stockpiling of property by people with money, corporations and so on. So there's a lot of kind of weaknesses there in the Japanese economy. And, and of course, one of the defining um, characteristics of the Japanese economy over the previous 40 years has been it's very powerful and very fast and rising very strong all the time. And it's in fact a pillar of Japanese success internationally. So the uh, the, the, the puncturing or the, the bursting of the bubble economy is a real problem in, in so much as it affects Japanese confidence. Of course, also coming into the 1990s, you have the end of the Cold War in 1991, and now the Americans and the Japanese have to reassess their relationship with each other. Um, the Japanese and the Americans had their problems. In particular, as I've said in a previous video, the Japanese government was very unhappy when Nixon went to China and didn't even tell the Japanese at all. And there was always this frustration because the Japanese were willing to be good soldiers as it were in the Cold War, but you know, nobody likes to be treated like an inferior and nobody likes to be treated like a little brother, which the Japanese occasionally did feel they were being, um, this is, they occasionally felt this is the way they're being treated. But of course with the 
uh, you know, the daily risk of nuclear war and the reality of the Soviet Union's existence only a few miles from the Japanese border up, up, up towards the north of Japan, off the very eastern coasts of Siberia, um, you always had that kind of unifying factor to keep the Japanese and the Americans together. Where will they go from here? And as the 1990s goes on, Japan enters into this kind of interesting, you know, phase, which is that, um, you know, people start talking about, is there a Japanese malaise? The GNP flattens about 1994. And since then, really, with a couple of small exceptions, they, they have not seen a return to high-speed growth. And that's a really big challenge, right? Because, you know, expecting these consistent rates of high growth or even consistent rates of 4 to 5% growth, which would be also absolutely stellar, is perhaps overly optimistic. But if that was a defining characteristic of your economy for 30 years, isn't it natural that you're going to feel, um, you know, that should continue? The 1990s also sees a major problem in Japan emerge, which is the significant aging of the population. Um, the success of the Japanese economy and the stability of post-war Japanese society had done a wonderful thing, which means, you know, it meant that your average Japanese person lived much longer and lived a healthy life much longer. But this doesn't necessarily mean they were in the workforce anymore. And so paying for these people has become extremely complicated. It also changes, you know, internal dynamics within households where, you know, if you're trying to keep a kind of a multi-generational household going where your parents and your children and you all live in the same space or at least are participating in the same kind of family interactions, um, when the parents are living for a very long time, now you have the grandchildren who as adults are interacting, you know, in their 30s and even 40s, are interacting with a couple of generations above them at the same time. And so kind of, you know, being in your 20s in Tokyo in 1990s Japan is much more difficult, arguably, than being in your 20s in the 1970s. Buying an apartment is extremely unlikely and probably just a pipe dream. And you have a whole series of obligations to the generations above you that are still alive. And if you're a woman, this is arguably even more complex. And, 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 and it, in fact, it probably is more complex. For example, the idea that once a woman reaches the age of 27 to 30, she is, quote unquote, you know, that's it, she's done, that she should be married at that point. Well, you've all these kind of, you know, um, conflicting problems throughout the 1990s, which is that Japanese feminism is continuing to evolve. It's going much more common for a Japanese woman to decide, well, you know, I, you know, I might get married. And if I do, it'll be because I want it to happen which doesn't necessarily conform with what her parents think. And you have all these kind of collisions of all these different kinds of ideas without that kind of driving forward focus of the economy against the threat of the Cold War to kind of keep all those things lined up. You also have a series of very unfortunate, um, uh, you know, uh, public tragedies such as the Kobe earthquake of 1995 and the Supreme Truth Cult in 1995, the subway attacks using poison gas uh, by a bunch of um, basically radical extremists that take the lives of people in the city of Tokyo. This is a pre-9-11 world, remember, although terrorism was sadly a common thing in parts of Europe and South Asia, this was a new kind of um, new problem for the Japanese experience. And this has kind of gone on, you know, up until as recently as 2011, the Tohoku earthquake and um, subsequent tsunami that saw the Fukushima Daiichi power plant compromised and, and very serious health issues and environmental concerns emerged following, including at one point a Japanese governmental pledge to remove nuclear power from Japan, which was kind of, you know, astonishing at the time. There's kind of this long sense of where is Japan going? Now, at the same time, I think it's important to point out um, that Japan remains a wealthy country. Japan remains um, a very attractive place to live for many, uh, many people uh, outside of Japan, if they'd like to get in there, although there's cultural complexities to that. And Japan, I suppose, is, you know, doing just fine. Um, but as the years go by, and as I continue to teach this class, uh, things start to come in more into focus. Uh, the Cold War dynamic of Japan allied with the US against the Soviet Union has now been completely shifted to how will Japan, or how is Japan handling the emergence of China as a regional, regional and global power? What is Japan's place in the world? It's hard to know, but the truth is, it's not as new as it might seem. I think it's tempting to look at a narrative of Japanese history and say, we knew exactly what Japan was from 1953 until 1991, and then everything changed, and now it's confusing. The truth is, it was always confusing. We, we have a more kind of convincing or more readily available narrative for the decades immediately following World War II. Um, but Japanese post-war experience, like every other nation's post-war experience, is a complex one. And the challenge that we have, and I know I've said this a lot in this class, but it really does bear worth, it, it, is, it does bear repeating, is that the challenge we have as historians is to do our best to evaluate this pattern of Japanese history based on what Japanese people are doing, decisions they are making, realities they are facing, 
um, and, and dynamics that are emerging in their own cultural experience to the best of our ability. Well, that's it. Um, that's it for the term. This term did not go the way I wanted. I don't think it went the way that you wanted. Um, for those of you who are seniors, best of luck to you. I hope that you will reach out and stay in touch with the faculty. I very much hope that you come back for the graduation celebration. For the rest of you, I'll see you next year. I can't wait to see you next academic year for a return to normality. Um, I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. Um, there'll be details over email about the final kind of exam, you know, final assignment type thing. You're all welcome to reach out and get in touch about that. Um, thank you for the kind words people have shared, both looking out for me and my family and for um, these videos that I put together Whew, uh, <laughs> as best I could. I'll try and give you guys something to kind of latch on to as best I could. Um, I just, I hope you're all doing well and I hope the fall brings better times for all of us and, um, take care of yourself. Goodbye.